poet Aaron Malou, who will have a conversation about adoption, being Midwestern raised, friendship, and other spontaneous topics spurred by your most recent books, led by St. Louis's Dana Levin. And I want to thank you all for coming out, supporting the event, for being virtual, and supporting the store of the event. Uh, we have a ton of really incredible events coming up this fall. Uh, we have Pulitzer Prize winner Andrew Sean Greer, Pulitzer Prize winner Buzz Bissinger. Uh, we have Corey Bush in October, the incredible, the amazing Corey Bush. Uh, so a lot of events to be really excited about that you might be interested in attending either in person or virtually. And now about tonight's authors. And Dan, can you say your name one more time? Sean. Sean. Okay, I was right. I felt as soon as I said it, I was like, I'm wrong. Wrong. Uh, yes. It makes you feel like you're wrong. That's it. Well, I mean, that well, it still kind of it does. It makes you feel like you're wrong no matter what you say. Yeah. I always feel like I'm wrong, though. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to start with Dan. Dan Sean is the author of several previous books, including Ill Will, a national bestseller named one of the 10 best books of 2017 by Publishers Weekly. Other works include the short story collection, Stay Awake a finalist for the Story Prize, the national bestseller, Await Your Reply, and Among the Missing, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Sean's fiction has appeared in the Best American Short Stories, the Pushcart Prize Anthologies, and the O. Henry Collection. He has been a finalist for the National Magazine Award in Fiction and the Shirley Jackson Award, and he was the recipient of an Academy Award in Literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Sean lives in Cleveland. Aaron Ballou is the author of Infanta, chosen by Hayden Carruth for the National Poetry Series, One Above and One Below, winner of the Midland Authors Prize and Ohioana Poetry Award, Black Box, a Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist, and Slant Six, named one of the 10 best books of 2014 by the New York Times all published by the incredible Copper Canyon Press. She currently teaches 
in the University of Houston's MFA and PhD Creative Writing Program and for the Leslie University Low Residency MFA Program in Chamber Cambridge, Massachusetts. And leading the discussion tonight will be Dana Levin. Dana's new book of poetry is Now Do You Know Where You Are? A Lennon, 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 thank you. Lennon. I've some glad we're all friends here in this room. Lennon. Lennon, literary Can someone else just do it? Her first, you would think this is my first time. Her first book in the surgical theater was chosen by Louise Gluck for the uh, American Poetry Review Hanukkah First Book Prize and went on to receive numerous honors, including the 2003 Penn Osterwald Award. The New Yorker called her third book, Sky Burial, utterly, utterly her own and utterly riveting. A Guggenheim and Rona Jaffe fellow, Levin currently serves as distinguished writer in residence at Maryville University in St. Louis. And now, without further ado, would you please help me in welcoming our fantastic guests for the evening? <laughs> Hello, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm very, very happy that my friends uh, Dan, Sean, and Aaron Ballou are here today um, because they're some of the funniest and smartest people I know, and it's always a joy to listen to them talk and to talk with them. And they're also really great writers, and I love both of their most recent books a lot. So what's going to happen is that um, they're both going to read for 10 minutes, um, 10 minutes each. And then I'm going to ask them a particular question that has to do with some wonky craft stuff, but I promise it won't be boring. And they can both answer this question, I know. And then we are gonna start talking about being mighty Midwesterners and eccentrics and adoptees and see where the conversation takes us. So the first person is who is gonna read is Aaron Ballou. Aaron Ballou, welcome. Does that work? I don't know. It doesn't seem to. Is this mic on? Yes. Oh, I just have to snuggle a little bit with it. There we go. Um, hi, thank you for coming in these trying times, as we always say. Um, I just thought I would start, I'm just going to read a couple of poems. Um, and I wanted to start with a poem called High Lonesome. Um, I think Dan and I will probably end up getting into this in conversation, and I'm gonna tell a very short version of this, but we didn't know each other. I think we knew of each other because like, there are only 11 people from Nebraska, and so we all are kind of aware of each other. But we ended up at the um, Indiana uh, Writers Conference. What's the name of that conference? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we ended up in Indiana. Um, as you do, and we were sat next to each other at a dinner table and we started doing the, you know, where are you from, where are you from thing. And one of the things that we discovered amongst a number of very odd, interesting coincidences uh, was that he was raised in Sydney, Nebraska, which is a very small town in the kind of panhandle-ish part of Nebraska. Okay, people would argue that, but yeah. So they were in the Panhandle, and my while I was not raised there, my grandparents were there. So I spent many, many, you know, months uh, visiting my my family there when I was a kid. Um, and so that was kind of an odd, interesting coincidence. And I have a poem that is set in Sydney, Nebraska, uh, which is a poem called "The High Lonesome," and it's about memories of my grandfather who had a soap pop bottling plant there. Um, so yeah, that's probably all you need to know about the poem. The other thing was, I wrote this poem, I had a mysterious illness that ended up being resolved at some point, but I was writing it during this period of having this illness that nobody could tell me what it was. So this is a poem called High Lonesome. Sick now for months, I wake to the cold glaze of a night sweat, a metabolic stone tossed into a mossy river. The dream keeps me company. Faithful as a sunflower, the same crenulated eye staring from its chronic bed where the moon greases the far wall. 
In the dark, I hear the snow counting to itself, pre-Mississippi, for Mississippi. The dream listens to old acquaintance, paid nursemaid nodding in the corner, the friend you no longer have to speak with to make yourself known. Welcome, genius Loki, gym fruit, weathering my salted field. Welcome home. I'm setting off with my father in the cab of the 7-Up company truck, his shotgun navigator working the route from Lisco to Lock Hole. August smoked brown at the edges, a dust-colored moth crushed beneath the plate glass of the plain's vaporous sky. And I am perched high on the black bench seat, thighs pinking against the burning vinyl, the chrome radio knobs in the shape of miniature crowns too scalding to turn. We're working the morning route from Lisco to Lodgepole, picking up the empties for my grandfather, bringing the bottomless box of stale candy bars and chewing gum for the gas station vending machines, and I smell the sugary acid stink rising from the wood slatted truck bed and hear the glass rattle bell the green bottles will make when my father loads them. The green glass rattle bell chattering 30 miles back to Sydney. Virus makes me plural, the whole unveiled, an archipelago, each organ cut off from the old continent, new islands populated by marsupials for whom we have no names, their ringed tails switch in the bloodstream. My, my geography is defined by those places I was told never to go. But the lure of the train tracks stretched out next to the bottling plant, where the brown bulls and rattlers drape themselves along the hawk rails, listless, scorched ribbons, their coils half hidden in chin high scrub. Not far away, someone's aunt stands out of the sun, hugging the shady rim at the plant's front entry, below the old ad for Kickapoo Joy Juice. The cartoon Indians poxed where the paint had flecked away. Usually, my father's younger sister not paying us any mind, wearing her discontented face, diamond chip earrings, and a shiny summer dress with quarter-sized spots of perspiration daubed like perfume under each arm. The Reaper's house was the only house visible beyond the tracks, where it leaned like a paper lantern from a rise in the unplowed field. You could see the white tarps laid out in a clearing beyond the front porch, a cinder block pinning each edge, the tarps smoothing over, the misshapen packages drying stiffly below them. Even then, I understood their business. Even then, I knew everything is parts. Now, at the side of the highway comes the brown-haired girl with her shoulder blades jutting out like two pink wishbones, the brown-haired girl carrying the white plastic bucket half full yeah and her father bending over the bloated cow's carcass down at the edge of the field, its hard rubber belly hairless and puckered like a dry lemon peel, her father sawing with his long-handled knife, slipping it between the fat and the skin. Sometimes she appeared on the old breezeway, a flock of smaller kids wandering out after her. And sometimes it was just her, the brown-haired girl, her face following the celebratory alarm my cousins would make, flinging handfuls of dust as the iron rails began to mutter, the train's pulse humming through us, the measure for how soon our freight would come. That's your Sydney poem. Fine. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> um, and then Dana had asked me to read uh, this poem for her. Um, and this is a 
Uh, I guess the backstory for this is that um, I've spent a big chunk of my life as a competitive diver. And um, I did that all the way through college. And I always wondered if there was a poem in that, because when you spend so much of your life, especially at that formative time in your life, I always knew that that <clears throat> seemed an important thing to whatever soul making that I had done for myself. Um, and I've always thought that poetry and diving actually had a lot in common. So, um, so I, this is the poem I finally got out of that experience of being a competitive springboard diver for so many years. Um, and this is a poem called She Returns to the Water. The dive starts on the board, something Steve often said. Or rub some dirt in it, princess, when in his lesser inscrutable mood. Steve of the hair gel and whistle, a man who was her diving coach, who never seemed to like her much, which was odd, given objectively her admirable discipline and natural gifts, the years and years of practice, and the long row of golden trophies she won for his team. The girl she was then, confused, partly feral, like the outdoor cat you feed when you remember to, but won't allow to come inside. She's thinking of Steve now, many years later, while swimming naked in her wealthy landlord's pool, or grotto, to call it properly, an ugly Italian word for something lovely, ringed as it is with red hibiscus, white lights and the mimosa trees draping their blurry pearls along the water's skin. It's 3 a.m., which seemed the safest time for this experiment, in which she's turned her strange and aging body loose. Once a man she loved observed, you're the kind of woman who feels embarrassed just standing in a room alone. A comment like him, two parts, two parts ill-spirited, and one perceptive. But this night she's dropped her robe, come here to be the kind of woman who swims naked without asking for permission, risking a stray neighbor getting the full gander, buoyed by salt water, all the tough and sag of her softened by this moonlight's nearsighted courtesy. Look at her, how the woman is floating while trying to recall the exact last moment of her girlhood, where she was, what she was doing, when she finally learned what she'd been taught, to hate this fleshy sack of boring anecdotes and moles she's lived inside so long, nemesis without a zipper for escape. A pearl is the oyster's autobiography, Bellini said. How clean and weightless the dive returns to the woman now, climbing the high metal ladder, then launching herself. No fear, no notion of self-preservation. The arc of her trajectory pretty as any arrow in St. Sebastian's side. How keen that girl and sleek, tumbling more gorgeous than two hawks courting in a dead drop. Floating, the woman remembers this again, how pristine she was in pike, or tucked tighter than a socialite, or twisting in reverse like a barber's pole, her body flying toward its pivot, which is, in those seconds, the infinite, before each possible outcome tears itself away. The woman is climbing from the water now, like the silvery tissue swaddling a costly gift. Thank you. Oh, okay, so I am going to read a chapter that doesn't, this is sort of a standalone chapter, um, so I don't really need much introduction. I picture myself on the second floor of an old three-story Victorian mansion that had been turned into a kind of boarding house. 
I can see that room with its rusty radiator and the single bed I loll around the all hours of the day, the whitewashed warty plaster of the walls I press my face against, the water stains on the ceiling that I find faces and figures in. The arrangement was not entirely legal, I don't think. There was no contract or lease, just an old lady who decided to start renting rooms in her house. Mrs. Dowdy was her name, and she lived alone on the first floor with her parrot. She was a widow, and recently her son Davis had committed suicide. Soon after I moved in, I was able to harvest Davis's social security number and so forth, and within a few months I had acquired a Davis Dowdy driver's license and passport. Meanwhile, I paid Mrs. Dowdy up front in cash monthly for a furnished room, shared bathroom, limited use of the kitchen. This was in Evanston, Illinois, 30 years ago, not long after I first escaped. Above me, I would hear a woman on the third floor walking. Her floorboards, my ceiling, would sigh as she paced, as if she was stepping over shifting ice. I didn't know her name, but I thought about her a lot. She walked above my bed at all hours of the night, and sometimes through the heating vent, I would hear her listening to music on the radio or reading her son a story, her voice stumbling and sweetly awkward. Good night, moon, I often heard her say. Most of the tenants in Mrs. Dowdy's house were on their way down in some way, and I imagine that maybe this woman and her boy were on the run from an abusive husband, or maybe the the dad had died tragically, cancer or something, and she was saddled with doctor bills she couldn't pay. Or maybe, more likely, she was just a single mom with limited resources, and this was the best that she could do. For a while, I would dream that I was holding that baby. The infant in the dream was wrapped in a blue hospital blanket with only its round face peeking out, and I would feel its limbs squirming beneath the swaddling as I smoothed my palm across its cheek, as I said, hush, hush, and then I would wake and the woman's footsteps were creaking above me. I imagined I could see the outlines of her bare feet as they pressed down. In some ways, this dream was partially hers, a seed her restlessness, her restlessness had planted in my sleeping mind. And maybe it was partially her fault, too, that I decided, against good common sense, to start going to these clinics. Was it the woman upstairs or the dream, or maybe simply the fact that I was alone in the world, unemployed, selling drugs sometimes to make ends meet, but mostly lying on my bed in my underwear with a beer growing warm on my belly? I reckon it was some combination of these things, the feeling that I was separated from the rest of the people of the earth by an invisible wall like a fish in an aquarium. Selling sperm was dumb, the way 20-year-old boys are dumb. And maybe there was a kind of magical hope attached to it too, like buying a lottery ticket or tossing a coin into a fountain. But it was also true that I was constantly on the make, even on the look, ever on the lookout for a new scam or scheme, and I wasn't above being drawn into an easy $50 I'd heard about through the guy I knew who was in the beginning year of medical school, Patches, he was called. We used to hang out together at a bar a few blocks from Mrs. Dowdy's place, and he would tell me all sorts of medical secrets. He was the one who told me about the sperm bank. He'd been depositing once or twice a week for beer money, and he gave me a number to call. I don't know whether they'll take you, Patches said. You're going to have to take an IQ test and a physical and then some gene testing as well. So they kind of run you through the gauntlet. He smiled. He was in the process of buying weed from me. This was back in the day when it was illegal. And the two of us were sampling the product together in an alley behind the bar, leaning near a sour smelling dumpster and passing the little brass pipe back and forth. I could tell that he didn't think I had the kind of pedigree they were looking for. He was just throwing it out there as a kind of rag, blonde, Northwestern med school boy who believed in the meritocracy, who believed he had earned his place in the world. The gauntlet, ha ha. So I went in and got an application, and I spent several mornings filling it out the questionnaire, sitting in Mrs. Dowdy's kitchen eating oatmeal, Mrs. Dowdy's parrot on its perch, spreading its molten, molting wings and preening them. I invented lie after lie about myself, and I tried to make my writing seem educated and poetic. Out the window, 
I watched that upstairs neighbor woman and her son, who must have been about four, a thin, deep-eyed kid with a head like a baby bird. I stared out at them as they went about their business in the unmowed backyard behind the boarding house, watching as the boy built something with mud and sticks in the corner by the fence, watching as he flipped through his book, the illustrated encyclopedia of the animal kingdom. On the cover, there were drawings of a snake, a zebra, a penguin, a beetle, all the same size. The woman sat quietly with a cigarette. She ran her fingers thoughtfully along the sides of her bare foot, her dry, processed hair crushed flat in the back where she slept on it. She exhaled smoke and I wrote a story about myself like a man who deserved to have a baby. And Mrs. Dowry's parrot said, hello, what's your name? In a high, insipid voice, and then took a nut from a dish and bit it savagely. Still, it was a surprise when the fertility clinic called me in, a feeling of deep embarrassment as I stood there before the nurse. She was a girl about the same age as me, a shy, pretty girl who wore her hair in a way that made me think she had an unhappy childhood. She couldn't look me in the eye. She just gave me some more forms to fill out and one of those clipboards with a pen hanging on a beaded metal chain. I turned in the paperwork and the nurse led me down a hospital smelling corridor, silence trading, trailing down the long hallway until we came to a halt in front of a little bathroom. She gave me a test tube with a screw on lid and cleared her throat, shifting her weight in those chunky white shoes. She opened the door and said there were some magazines I could look at if I needed to. Some old penthouse and hustler magazines were stacked on a shelf next to the toilet and I nodded. What was there to say? The nurse was trying to be professional about it, but I could see she was secretly mortified behind her nurse facade. And when I tried to smile ironically, she just cleared her throat again and left in a hurry, poor girl. It was strange because it was she, the nurse, who I ended up thinking about rather than the porn magazine girls with their tawny, unreal shapes and unmarked expressions. When I brought the test tube out, I gave it to her and I felt a flutter in my stomach. Her eyes were so sad and horrified that it seemed she must have known that I'd been thinking of her. Afterwards, I sometimes thought that any baby that came from it would be as much that nurse's as it was my own. But I never really believed that there would be a baby. It was just something I like to daydream about sometimes. In another life, I thought there existed the possibility of a person who might have a certain shape of their jaw or their fingers or a certain way of smiling and when they were sad or might even eventually drop develop certain moods particular watery melancholy slightly empty slightly lost slightly delighted all because of me a few weeks before i made my first donation i happened to find a box of books the box had been put out by the curb for the trash man to pick up right outside the big old house that looked something like ours, except it hadn't been split, split up into apartments. There was nothing wrong with the books that I could see. An old set of children's encyclopedias, not complete, but nice enough, with beautiful photographs. It didn't even look like they'd been read. I glanced around to see that no one was looking, and I lifted the box and carried it home. After the dinner that evening, I went up the stairs with the box and knocked on the woman's door. I found this, I said, showing her the books and tried to smile like a normal, friendly person. I've heard you reading to your son and I thought it would be something he would like to look at. I practiced this short speech several times, but after it left my mouth, I realized that it was a mistake to say that I'd been listening to her reading. It made me sound like a stalker and I saw her eyes narrow. When she leaned down to look at the titles of the books, she wrinkled her nose. I was aware that they smelled a little like a basement. He's a little young for encyclopedias, she said, and I shifted my weight. The books were heavy. Right on, I said, but they've got nice pictures. Uh-huh, she said, and looked me over again, and her eyes came to a decision. I sensed that she saw something essential about me that she could never learn to like. I didn't know what it was exactly, but I could feel it in the air around me, an aroma. If you want to leave them, she said, that's okay. I mean, they'll probably just wreck them, color in them and stuff. You could probably sell them. She put a hand against her hair. You don't have kids of your own, she said. Oh no, I smiled. 
hesitating because she made no move to take the box. I braced it against my hip. Well, not really. After a second, I realized that this was an odd thing to say. None that I know of, ha huh? I said before I realized that this made things worse. Oh, she said. She laughed shortly. You're one of those, huh? She looked at me briefly with something like, what, flirtation, sarcasm? Something familiar, but not quite friendly. I couldn't tell, but it made me blush, and I set the box down. No, I said, it's, uh, it's complicated. I'll bet, she said. She gave me that same look again, and I watched her thinking a whole complex set of unreadable things was passing through her mind. She opened the, little, the door a little more, and I could see the boy inside, sitting cross-legged in front of the television, his face lit unnaturally as he trotted a plastic elephant along the carpet. It would have been neat if the boy turned suddenly to look at me, but he didn't. Well, the woman said, thanks. At that time, I was a fugitive from justice, wrongly arrested, imprisoned, and then institutionalized in a mental facility. I couldn't tell you what the charges were, only that I, was, I thought they were ridiculous, and I said so, and soon an officer was leaning down with his sharp kneecap on the small of my back and applying handcuffs to my wrists, and once I was seen as recalcitrant and resistant, it was beyond hope. Further protests landed me in the psychiatric care division of the Hopewood Memorial Hospital, where I was pumped full of Thorazine and left to drift for eternity. I don't know how I escaped. There were only a few, few brief flashes. I remember clambering through cattails in an irrigation ditch, wearing nothing but pajama bottoms, shaved bald and 100 pounds overweight, fattened by antipsychotics and lack of movement. I remember smearing dark green pond mud into my hair and over my face and body. I remember that at one point I was trying to wash myself off in a gas station bathroom, and then I stole a pair of coveralls from the mechanic's garage. But now it was OK. When I first moved into the apartment in Chicago, the little boy was having bad nightmares. The child would sometimes wake up screaming, and of course I would wake it as well. Help me, I thought I could hear the little boy crying. Help me. At last, I would hear the woman's footsteps. Hush, she would whisper. Everything's fine. And then she would begin to sing. I don't know why this affected me so, the sound of her singing. But I can remember how I shuddered. I thought of my own mother, dead by my hand. I thought of the authorities in another state who were still hunting me. And there were no friends in my life, only strangers. And I curled up a little more, whispering, hush, hush, it's nothing. You are okay, my little one. It will all be all right. But there was a great churn of loneliness that opened up in me, that longing we have for kindred that some cruel God must have built into us. Can I take this out of here? Yeah, I was also coming in. because um, that was the thing that really became apparent to me as I was listening to both of you, and I know these books really well. What you need to understand about the main character of Dan's book is that, help me if I get this wrong, he's a contract killer, is that right? Mm -hmm. And he's kind of a cleanup guy for other nefarious, violent things, is that correct? He, he works for a, a corporation called Value Standard Enterprises. Yes, yeah. where, he's, where he's a killer. And it's set in this sort of slightly in the future dystopia, which has its own qualities that feel very Midwest to me, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but this main character finds out that as a sperm donor, he, um, unbeknownst to him, is the father of 148 children. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Do I have the right number? I think it's 167. Okay, a lot. A lot. Okay. Also, he's the funniest, warmest main character I think I've ever experienced. He's also a contract killer. This main character pines for children. And someone 
ends up calling him saying, you know, I'm your daughter. And this sets the plot going along. And so I was thinking about that in relationship to being an adoptee. And then I was thinking about, you know, listening to Aaron's poems, that there's so much reclamation work that is also going on in here that it's not outer directed as dances, which maybe you would expect from a novel, but it's inner, inner directed in terms of reclaiming and also releasing old parts of the self. But in both of these books, it seems like there's this impulse to reclaim and rectify. And I wonder if either of you want to say anything about that. And because I was thinking about both of you as adoptees, that became really interesting to me. So I was wondering, um, Dan, if you want to start and then Aaron can chime in. Well, I think there's like, um, when you, you know, like the, the uh, circumstances of your birth are, are an actual state secret. Um, there's this like MP part that you're always projecting into. Um, and that is, I think, sort of the condition of growing up as an adoptee. For me, it was. I, th I think I'm, I'm a little more radicalized about this shit than you are, but maybe not. Um, wait, wait, what do you mean by that? Um, I think that adoption as it's as it was practiced when um, when we were kids is really uh, extremely problematic. Can oh, you can, can you both describe that? Like, what does that mean? Um, well, I think both of our mothers were uh, whisked away to a, a home for unwed mothers, where they gave up a, a baby and were told that they that the baby would never be able to contact them again. Um, that all of this was going to be a secret, and then. We had our birth certificates legally changed, um, but it turns out that we couldn't we couldn't actually get things like passports with our birth certificates. We had to send them to the state so that they could show the real birth certificate to the passport place because we didn't actually possess a big bony birth certificate. And neither one of us has access to a natural birth certificate. Wow. Uh, part so of that is being from the state of Nebraska. Part of it's but that's not that's not uncommon. So it's this like it, it, it's not just a um, it's not just a secret. There's 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 a charade element to it, right? Um, there's you know like we're we're going to give you this birth certificate so you can pretend that the people who adopted you are actually your birth parents, and we're going to do all these things that kind of create this um, like diorama. Um, of, of a, you know, um, traditional family. Um, so I guess, I guess to preserve everybody from discomfort, that's the Midwestern way. Well, and also to protect the birth mothers from the unspeakable shame right, of, 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 us. Of, of having a bastard yeah. child. Right, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> so it's a very odd, it's a very odd way to, I, I, I don't think it's, and again, I'm not going to speak for both of us, but you can chime in, but I mean, I think one of the things that, that I know sociologically that children do is that part of play and part of the way children interact with each other is constantly checking in about like, who, who am I, where am I from, who are my people, what is my mythology? from my family, right? right. And, I, and I've often wondered, there's no way to do the math or the, the statistics of this, but I think sometimes for people who come to the world with a big question mark around their identity, um, like my parents did as good a job as you can possibly do with adoption in terms of like, they actually made me believe that people who weren't adopted were kind of low class, um, because like some people just took whatever maybe took. <laughs> We were a little pickier and picked out the one one. But I mean, as you get older and you start to get this, like, you, you don't, you realize there's some little rupture, like, in your mythology, right? And I, and I, and I was just a kind of pathological liar as a child because I was always inventing stories about myself. Some of them, there were, and, and I know my teachers were actually concerned because some of the stories were really, like, I had this whole thing about, like, 
I wasn't really worried about the dates in history that I was referencing. So I had a whole thing about like, my father was an RAF fighter and my mother was like a poor Irish woman. And I would just tell, I would make up these stories and I realized much later that these stories were all stories that were creating, the, the act of imagining was like imagining myself into being in some way because I didn't have the kind of story that I would did you ever do this? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you also you know have a poem in uh, in there about that's about hiding, um, and I remember doing that a lot too, hiding and spying, um, yeah. and like always like feeling a little bit more like an outsider than than was normal. I mean, there's a, there's a weird there's a there, I don't I don't know what this happened to you, but there was a weird pressure to um, like. Oh, you look so much like your dad, meaning my adopted father, which, you know, sort of, but that, that idea that we were going to pretend like there was all this, there was some sort of biological thing going on when there wasn't. I mean, and that's, I think, also goes back to the first of the Right. You know, I hope this doesn't sound insulting. I just find it fascinating. Like, as you describe this and describe issues of being outsiders and asking questions like who am i and you know projecting into different kinds of am i this kind of person am i this kind of person like that's lyric poetry right those are the central questions that we ask in a classic lyric poem when you know to me i always think of the classic lyric poem as a single speaker on the stage of the poem singing their aria and the central question is who am i why am i here right and you know, that's really literal for you. And I feel that in these poems, that quest. And um, you also, was it during the writing of this that you got in touch with your birth family or your birth parents and their yeah, children? Yeah, so my oldest friend, who is a like super sleuth genealogical person, because the thing about the circumstances that Dan and I were in is that there are all kinds of impediments up until the moment of DNA testing where they really, are doing everything they can to keep you from finding your birth family. <clears throat> Part of it was, well, anyway, that's a little long story. But a good friend of mine tracked down my biological parents um, just a couple of years ago. And um, and so that so the whole DNA testing has been this wild west of sort of all of these people that were told they would never be found. Right. Are and some of them don't want to be found. We don't want to be found. Yeah. Oh, lots of them don't want. And, yeah. and interestingly, birth. I mean, when you, there, there's a whole backstory here about what they did. Like they, one of the, I, I think this is a really interesting. But story. we should also mention that we are both adopted from the same agency. About the same time. About the same time. Right. So we're sitting at a dinner in Indiana, and it's like, where are you from? Where are you from? And before we we're about to turn to the person to our right, Dan said. You know, he was from Sydney, and I was like, oh, my grandparents, he remembered my grandparents' plant, and then he goes, oh, but I was adopted, and I was actually born in Omaha, and I was like, what? <laughs> um, and then we did that weird thing, and it was like, when were you born, when were you, and which one, which one, and then it was like, oh. yeah. So it was a very, it's one of those moments where the pattern emerges from the chaos, and you think, God, that's got to mean something. Right um, or destiny or whatever for two people who are both writers from Nebraska to end up in Indiana at a dinner table talking to each other about the fact that they were born at the same time in the same home for unwed mothers. Mm -hmm. That seems kind of odd. So your mothers may have known each other. Mm, I don't think we're that close. In. You're 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 almost a year older. Than I'm you. almost a year. So I would and I was there for six. It's almost seven months. But it does make me think, and I feel really embarrassed and I realize this is being virtually streamed, but like, I just somehow, maybe it's because I want to believe in it, but some things do feel like, and I, and this is something that comes up in my poems all the time, and I didn't realize how much of this is probably tied to the conversation we're having, but I'm always thinking about this notion of destiny. And in like in the book I was just reading, the, like this, the older book I was reading from, I have a poem called "Your Character Is Your Destiny," and I'm always thinking about this idea of you know chaos theory versus some sort of actual 
plan yeah, pattern, right? But I also think that also seems, and again, you would think I would read up about this since I'm just running my mouth about it in front of the microphone, not actually knowing the answers to these things. But I think there's got to be some sort of sociological study around the sort of identity formation of adoptees, and I assume there, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. Right. Yeah. You should share it with me sometime. Yeah. Well, I just, I'm, I'm just on my adoptee Twitter. Oh but my God. You can, you can learn so much. But this has become a really big thing because there are all of these people who are just suddenly in the last couple of years finding, um, you know, whether those families wish to be found or not, right? It's, it's all happening, but it's always been, and I know this is true because I know Dan Hall Dan's writing. Um, this has been a central motif for both of us, mm -hmm. right? This kind of an essential question mark around, I don't know, sense of self. Is that the way of putting it? Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know. I wonder how many writers are adopted. I don't know. That would be actually a really interesting thing to find out, artists in general, right? I mean, those who feel outside, right, often find themselves um, drawn to the expressive arts. Sure, so it's one version, like, because I think most of the people I know who make art for a lifetime are people who have positioned themselves or have found themselves in a position of being standing over here and looking. Mm -hmm. I, don't, right. I don't know very many artists who are like, I'm right in the middle of it all, right? <laughs> um, there's some, there, there's some. Yeah, there are some, but yeah, I think. Yeah, I wouldn't hang out. <laughs> so, um, Dan, then, like in this new book where the stuff around having children and being found by your children and not knowing you had children, like that's so overt in this book. Were you thinking about your own adopting this as you were writing this more intensely or? Um, yeah, I mean, to some extent I was, I, I was, I wanted to write about my own experience meeting my birth father, um, who died like right around the time that this, that I started writing this. Um, I was interested in like kind of exploring that without exploring it autobiographical. I don't, I don't like to do autobiographical stuff. I have to have some element that, that puts me outside of it or I get frozen. Um, so in this case, I did, I did a lot of different layers to, to separate that experience from what was happening in the novel. But it, I mean, that's, I think that's sort of the core emotion that I wanted to write about was that really weird um, period when we were first getting to know each other and um, just sort of the, that experience of having a connection with somebody who I'd never I had known for the first 30 years of my life, and it was simply this very intense yeah. relationship. Well, because you know, what's interesting is that, I mean, I told you the plot of this crazy book, and I mean, it's a really, like, crazy. It's a crazy It's book. a crazy plot, and it, it totally works. For a contract killer main character, who also is very warm and funny, and all sorts of strange things are going on in this near future dystopia. Like, if you can afford it, you can have your own militia. Um, there's all sorts of strange robots and drones that look like weird emojis come to life that are wandering around everywhere. I mean, there's just, and they're all offered sort of nonchalantly. So there's like this weird future dystopic thing, and then there's the contract killer thing, and then there's the sperm donor thing, and being the, you know, the father of 162 children and not knowing it, and being on the lamb with the dog that you rescued. I mean, but it totally works. The point I'm trying to make, it's, though. It's a page turner. Oh, it is. The point I'm trying to make, I'm just showing you the wrong part of the book, um, is uh, the primary feeling tone to me of this character is yearning. True, heartfelt, deep yearning. Mm -hmm. And it is driving this character into all of the situations that he finds himself in. And he knows that it's dangerous to yearn. Um, be, for the very reason that he needs to be hiding and keeping away from the people who are after him, but he just cannot, he cannot help himself about finding this destiny, right? Which turns out to be this young woman who has contacted him saying, I'm your biological daughter. And does that feel right to you that yearning is what drives this book mm -hmm. as, as the feeling tone of it? Mm -hmm. 
can you say something about that? I don't even know. I'm just struck that with such a crazy, crazy plot. That is the feeling tone. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think you. I think like every novel has its own sort of music that goes along with it, and it's it's an, it's it's some kind of emotion that you wanna that you wanna explore, and it and and then like all the other doodads, the plot and characters and you know scenes and stuff sort of affix themselves around that and all take on the same coloring of that emotion. But at least that's my experience. I don't start with plot. I, I start with that with some kind of idea that, that, that makes my like skin tingle. Oh, I love that. So with this book though, it feels like sort of liberating oneself from yearning. I'm just thinking about yearning and being adopted and this not, you know, not knowing where you come from and 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 that sense of destiny. And when I think about yearning, I think of it as a feeling where you are missing something that has never been there. Um, and then at some point, if it has been oppressive to you, you have to figure out how to liberate yourself out of it. I mean, She Returns to the Water, to me, in a way, feels like a poem that's a reclamation of self out of all of the ways in which the earlier, younger self felt uncertain or judged or not seen or unloved. Unloved. Can you talk about that in relationship to um, being an adoptee, if that feels like an accurate uh, connection? I mean, I, I think it's one of those many layers. I, I mean, because I imagine there are people in the audience right now who also have those feelings of emptiness, loneliness, uh, being unloved and whatever, and it's just, Unfortunately, human, there are many different paths in the human condition to feeling that way. I think just what Dan and I have in common is that one of the paths that we were taken down from the circumstances of, of our, you know, that's our particular story. Other people arrive at it from obviously a different direction. But I do think one of the things about um, this most recent book, Come Hither Honeycomb, is having gone through just, you know, and again, I. I wish I had like studies in front of me, but I mean, you know, I've often wondered why, I'm trying to think about how to say this, um, you know, you know, people will tell you often if you're adopted that you must have abandonment issues, right? And I think I can't claim that's true or not true for everyone who's adopted, but there is something to think about like, from that sort of okay, you think it's true? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, I mean, unless you unless you like got your head in a bucket, um, I mean, it's like that's the that's the that's the actual condition of your of your birth. Oh, like it's like, literal. Like, you have been abandoned. Right. Okay. I just didn't want to. I didn't want to be like okay, like every single person statistic. Oh, I mean, I'm like, sure there's somebody that's like, oh, yeah, well, I loved it. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's probably but, the exception. <laughs> But I mean, thinking about you know how much of my you know it's it's funny to get to a certain age where you finally and I think this is true for this book you go through our dark night of the soul and you go through all kinds of you know relationships where you know that abandonment and that that thing that's at the center of you finally does maybe I mean not on wood I'm not jinxing myself. But then you, you know, maybe you actually do achieve some greater sense of wholeness, where the like the puzzle, you know, kind of fractures heal a little bit. Um, I'm making my book sound very sort of hippy dippy and woo, but hippy uh, dippy is fine. I mean, it's not. It's and not it's fun. really not. So yeah, okay. and it's fine. not. It's, it's not. not there. That's I'm not. Bad. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not very well. That woo by nature. Okay, but, I'll finish and then I'll say something about the Midwest. But I do think this book does kind of trace this, like having gone through, you know, this sort of ultimate kind of shattering and coming out the other end of finally putting a bunch of things, you know, and of course, it's hilarious, you figure this out when you're in your 50s, right? And it's like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And maybe that's part of just being this age, if you're lucky, is just sort of going through that process till you get to something that feels a little more assembled. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, dare I say, I feel a little bit more 
assemble. But you know, I don't know how much of it also had to do with, I know something, I know there were two moments in my life, my son, having my son, who was the first person I was ever, that I was biologically related to that I ever met, I felt like without even me knowing it, it sort of just sort of built in some hole. Yeah, me too. And then meeting my, and then meeting and having this wonderful relationship with my birth father. And that was all happening sort of around the time of the writing of this. So I don't know, maybe I, I feel like I got a happy, I got a really happy. Well, Will Dare, which is the name of this main character, I only realized like six months after I read the book that that's a pun, Will Bear, um, ends up having a happy ending of a sort. Yes, he does have a happy ending. Which shocked me as I as I was you know going through this book. Um, in terms of like the Midwesternness, this is why the hippy dippy aspect isn't so hippy dippy, and why a happy ending in the novel. Um, isn't like a sentimental triacly thing. You are both so down to earth about the ways that you talk about emotional dif difficulty and human frailty. These are qualities that I affiliate with being from the Midwest. I don't know if that's accurate or not. I was my parents are from Chicago, but I was raised in Southern California. So. I just want to say because you're not from the Midwest, I want you to understand that there are many nations within. The Midwest. Oh, okay. We are actually from the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. And we are the sternest, flintiest, least hippy dippy. <laughs> um, just just as an example, uh, Aaron had, had, had brought this, this really beautiful kimono and asked me how it looked, and I said, fine. <laughs> and that was like from a Midwestern, that's a pretty high From the Great Plains. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's absolutely. Mm -hmm. But then later he recovered and said, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 do, I do think there is something, uh, there's something, uh, there's something, there's a, there's a sternness, which is not to say there's not like warmth and affection and sunshine and all of those other things, but there's a, there's just a kind of. I th like, I think there's an impatience with, um, with navel gazing and, and or even yeah, acknowledging, kind of acknowledging like heavy duty emotions. Right. And anybody who is, you know, like I think one of the things that's true about my work, and I think it's also true about Dan's work, is that there's a lot of skewering of pretension. Um, I would think there's a sort of reflexive, ironic eyebrow cocked at a lot of nonsense. Right. Um, and I, I mean, just between us and a live, you know, feed or whatever, you know, I was worried that it keeps me from being genuinely lyric. Because when I when I start to lean into that kind of gesture, I just think, oh, come on. <laughs> like, who are you kidding, you pretentious fuck? I mean, settle down. You're not Shelly, for God's sakes. And I want to think that maybe I can turn that towards something that's uniquely my own, but I feel like that's like that is something that is particularly interesting. Is, is that, that I don't have a lyric bone in my mouth. Well, that you no, that's not that's not that you do, you do, but you're but you're suspicious of it, and you can tell you're suspicious of it. Utterly uh, suspicious of it. Mm. But you're suspicious of it too. Yeah, I'm a little bit more of a sap than you. Okay, this brings me, because we, we have five minutes, and this brings okay. me to my last question. You don't want us to talk about ourselves at end this What about, I can sit here for three hours. Okay. I'm going to come to my technical question. Oh, good, good. Because this leads right in. Um, this novel is constructed like a poem. There are refrain lines. There are, I mean, it's there's this thing that keeps happening. Oops! Where um, the character keeps saying, um, that would be the worst ending, I think, to gasp your last breath with a slow realization dawning on you. My wish is that I'll wake up one day on a desert island with amnesia. The character says this over and over again. Sometimes the sentences are a little bit different. I tracked it through the whole book. What's amazing is that by the end of the novel, this repetition resolves in a very satisfying way. So this really felt like it was built like a poem. Your book, Erin, your narrative gift is amazing. Like, these are stories that you told us tonight. But 
but they're written so amazingly fluidly and with such um, lyric movements. Um, I just, they seem effortless, but they're very difficult. And I see that Nikki is going like this, so I feel, I feel glad. So Dan's a poet and you're a storyteller. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how the other art form informs what you do. How does poetry, how, did you realize that you wrote yeah, a poem? Yeah, I mean, I, I started out as a poet. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, that was that was what I wanted. I mean, I, I, I did both, but I really, I really loved poetry. Um, and um, I was at a, a student at Northwestern, and um, my teacher, Mary Kinsey, told me, you know, I think you would really do well with fiction. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so and very I, kind of Mary. She, yeah, I mean, no, she, she relentlessly discouraged me, as a matter of fact. But I still love, I still loved uh, poetry, and I still read it, and I still think about things that I want to from poetry that that, that, that I want to put in prose. And one of them is the refrain, and the, um, I mean, I like, I really like the line break. I, I miss the line break a lot. So I did a whole novel where I where I stole the line break from poets. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, but this is yeah, this is definitely a, something where I'm where I got, where I was using like specific. Yeah, it's fascinating um, how much this is constructed like a poem. Talk about storytelling. Well, I started out as a fiction writer. Oh my <laughs> god, I did not know. And I had a teacher tell me. <laughs> You'd be much uh, better writing poetry. Pretty much. They were like, you know, your, your lines are beautiful, your sentences are beautiful, but like, how did they get in the car? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know how they got in the car, they're just in the car. Um, and and so I would try to and try to write stories, and I still think maybe a good. I'm not ruling it out. I mean, and, but the thing is, I read, I just imbibe tons of fiction because I love stories and I love storytelling. Um, and then at some point, I realized that you know, I also love the line. Right. I, it turns out I love the line more than I love the sentence. It's amazing the power that we give teachers over these poor undergraduates. Yeah, I mean, just one word and suddenly the whole trajectory just changes. Or maybe they see something in us because, you know, Mary was right. You're an amazing picture writer. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope my teacher was right in that the this, this sense, the shape of poems, not that anybody would say it comes easily to anyone ever, but it just made more sense. Just made a sort of natural sense to me, the idea of a line. Which is what prose poems don't make any sense to me, but mm -hmm. you can have it written them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. I mean, we could talk for another hour, but Shane went like this. So I think we have to stop. Um, thank you, everybody who came. Thank you, anybody who's watching the live feed. Please, um, you should buy Aaron Ballou's book. Come hither, honeycomb. Come hither, honeycomb. Say that five times fast. In Dan John's novel, Sleepwalk, a book of poems full of stories, a novel that's written like a poem. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your evening. And don't forget. Oh, right. I have a book. I forgot. Jake Levin also has a book that came out this year. Yes. Um, now you know where you are. No, now do you know? Now do you know where you are? Yeah. Now do you know? Now where do you know you where you are? Now do you know where you are? Yeah. Okay. Neither do I. Bye. Thanks for coming.